Okay, here we are, 12 videos in, and I originally thought I could do this in six. Well, boy, was I wrong. Here we are. I swear, this is, I mean, we've got one more video to go, I think, after this. I think I can kind of tie it up. The last video might be a little bit longer than the other ones, but uh, nevertheless, it uh, looks like this will be a 13-part series on Heidegger's origin of the work of art. Great essay, I think. I mean, a difficult essay, hard essay to sort of trudge through, but quite rewarding if you're willing to take the time to sort of dig through it and see what's going on. So in this video, we're going to pick up right where we left off. We were talking in the last video about the rift design and the, the createdness of the work of art. What, what is the nature of the creativeness? Why is it special? Why is it different from uh, other things that are made and, 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 and produced, manufactured? Um, and so towards the end of that video, at the very tail end, we talked about how obviously creativeness is an important part of the work, but also the fact that the work is preserved. There's a certain preserving, a certain uh, uh, respect for the work, okay? So in this video, we're going to focus a little bit more on that and, and elaborate a bit more on the preservation of the work, how that's an aspect of it as well. That's how the work works is through a preservation as well. Uh, and then also we'll get into... Uh, coming back to the beginning of the of the essay finally turning around back to this question of the thingliness of the work of art why how is it a thing right so so yeah, so far this whole essay has been i guess you could see it as a, as a bit of a digression right so so heidegger uh you know i've already mentioned this before but heidegger this essay is a part of a series of lectures that he uh, of, of presentations lectures talks that he gave on das Ding, the thing, right? So There's just one particular thing, a work of art. And so at the beginning, he's trying to get at the thingliness of the thing. What is a thing in general? And, you know, in, in the early lectures, we talked about the different interpretations of the thing throughout Western philosophy and how all of them somehow uh, fall short. They're not able to tap at the, the being of the work or the, or the quality of it as a work and what distinguishes it from other things. And so, there's a bit of a digression, and then finally Heidegger is going to come back to that question here, and so we're, we're going to try to resolve it in this video. So there's a lot to cover. Uh, I better just stop with all this introductory uh, nice material here uh, to sort of get us uh, situated, just jump right in. So let's read this first quote here, uh, again, about preserving the work as, as, as a constitutive part of it being a work. So he, again, and, and maybe I should sort of back up because this sort of uh, uh, bounces off a previous quote. So let's just, the, the last line here, let's reread it. Just as a work cannot be without being created, but is essentially in need of creators. So what is created cannot itself come into being without those who preserve it, right? Okay, so there's all, that, that preservers are a necessary element. However, if a work does not find preservers, does not at once find them such as respond to the truth happening in the work, this does not at all mean that the work may also be a work without preservers, right? So just because a work of art is created and is not appreciated immediately by the art public, by, by those who see it, right? Like I have this painting of Gauguin, right? And uh, Gauguin, you know, Paul Gauguin, or people say, I think it's Gauguin, actually. Paul Gauguin, right? He's generally considered a genius, you know, artistic genius, uh, influential to all sorts of artists after him. You know, his works are displayed in fine art museums throughout the world now. He started the sort of what's called the primitivist uh, movement in, in painting. Uh, but his artwork was not appreciated at the time, right? He was not considered a good artist. He wasn't, you know, he wasn't famous or popular or well regarded. He had some good, uh, you know, well, well, he had good connections in the art world. I guess he had friends that were, you know, respected artists, but he wasn't fully appreciated until after he was dead, right? And this is the case in a lot, of, a, a lot of the time, tragically, I suppose, that the artist is never appreciated in their own lifetime. It's not till years later that people kind of, you know, uh, uncover them and say, "Geez, there's something going on here. This is brilliant work. This is this guy's, you know, he's he's showing something, right?" As Heidegger put it, he's bringing forth truth, right? And someone finally responds to this truth happening in the work. Um, so again, it doesn't it doesn't mean that the work. Um, is always going to have this from the get-go. Uh, being a work, it always remains tied to preservers, even and particularly when it is still only waiting for preservers. 
and only pleads and waits for them to enter into its truth. Even the oblivion into which the work can sink is not nothing. It is still a preservation. It feeds on the work. Now, honestly, I kind of have a problem with that. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what, what Heidegger's saying here, right? I, I, so how is it that, that the oblivion into which the work can sink is still a preservation, right? So if Gauguin's paintings are not appreciated during his lifetime, how is that still a preserving, right? I guess they're still being set aside. It's not preserving in this sense, though. It's not responding to the truth that's happening in the work with respect, okay? So I, when he says that it feeds on the work, I, to me, that's just too. I, I talked about uh, Heidegger's grandiose language in previous videos, and I think this is an example of it here. I think he's being a bit grandiose to say that that it feeds on the work, even when the work is sort of cast aside and not appreciated or not even noticed. You know, what what if I make a painting that's the most amazing painting ever done, and it would revolutionize painting, revolutionize the art world? It's hard hard to think of something like that. Every, everything's kind of been done with painting, it seems. But let's just say, you know, just for the sake of argument, I do something like that, and I and I I don't even show it to anybody, right? Maybe the only people that notice are people that come over to my house and, and notice every once in a while, right? I don't understand how like the 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 oblivion, right? The fact that the, the general public, the world at large, doesn't know about my brilliant painting. Um, how does that feed off of it if it doesn't even? I mean, I talked to a friend of mine earlier about this because I have problems with it. He's a Heideggerian and did his PhD on Heidegger, and he kind of talks about how. To me, this is a trivial truth, and and certainly it's the case. So yeah, Heidegger's right here, but I think he's being grandiose, but. My friend was sort of saying, well, yeah, the world's different now that, that your work is in it. Whether or not it's acknowledged or not, that makes the world a different place. There's another layer to it, another layer that it's concealed. It could be unconcealed, but it adds a sort of uh, a, a, another element, another depth to the world, right? Which for Heidegger, again, we can never have the world fully in view. Um, you can review my earlier videos where we focus more on the world to sort of, you know, get clear about what I mean by that and what he means by that. You know, it's not like you can picture the world, we inhabit the world, right? And when a work is not appreciated by the general public, it's still a part of the world, you know? So I don't know, but to say that it feeds on the work, uh, to me, that's, that's a bit strong verbiage there, um, although a point is maybe taken. So preserving the work means as Heidegger puts it, it's, it means standing within the openness of beings that happens in the work, okay? So we're able to see in, in Gauguin's paintings, you know, he went to the islands of Haiti and he, he painted the natives, and we were able to see the truth in there. We, you know, we were transported to the world of the islanders or something like this, perhaps. Those, those beings uh, had a sort of openness, a sort of comportment with the world around them. And in the paintings of Gauguin, not this one, but the ones of the Islanders in Haiti, of course, uh, they, they, they will stand forth, but people just weren't there to see it. They just saw oh, this, it's simple. His brush strokes are really simple and he doesn't have all this detail. Interesting shading, sure, but it's all flat and no depth and, you know, very simplistic. We don't, it's primitive, you know, uh, very negative critics. They, they didn't see the truth, right, that was, that was happening in the work of Gauguin, right? Um, so again, uh, preserving means uh, standing within the openness of beings that happens in the work. This, this standing within of preservation, however, is a knowing. Yet knowing does not consist in mere information and notions about something. He who truly knows what is, knows what he wills to do in the midst of what is. Okay, so, so there's this sort of i guess awareness of one's place and one's intentions and and where and what the basis of those intentions and and goals are right they're always housed within the world within this this human context and once we're sort of appreciative of that we sort of have this knowledge and this appreciation of certain works of art perhaps they 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 speak to us some fail to speak to us because we're not able to see the openness of beings, right, as he puts it here, uh, that is present in the work, happens in the work. <clears throat> so this knowledge, which, which as a willing, he puts it, makes its home in the work's truth and only thus remains a knowing. 
does not deprive the work of its independence, does not drag it into the sphere, the sphere of mere experience, and does not degrade it to the role of a stimulator of experience. This is a confusing point, I think, about Heidegger. You, you know, you, you're left with the impression, I think, uh, oddly, that, you know, in a sort of sense, he's similar to Kant. You know, Kant thinks a work of art is supposed to just stimulate our imagination in a very abstract way, right? For Heidegger, it's supposed to make us, you know, dwell in the truth of the work, right? To preserve the truth that's happening in the work, to see the strife between world and earth, uh, and to, you know, to have this sort of repose, to have this sort of response. But he wants to sort of qualify here. He's not talking about, you know, as he puts it, um, a stimulator of experience. Oh, wow, that was cool. That was neat. That was fun. I, that was, you know, it was entertaining. That's a sort of, um, you know, almost a distraction. So he wants, he wants to distinguish between what he's talking about here as a sort of knowing and a sort of response to the work versus, again, the sort of stimulator of experience. Preserving the work does not reduce people to their private experiences, but brings them into affiliation with the truth happening in the work. So when I watch the movie Apocalypse Now, it makes me think about, and I'm not just like, wow, that was a cool movie. I liked it. It was fun. This was a part that I enjoyed. If I'm doing it, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying it at a very superficial level. For the work to really strike me, it makes me think about the nature of war and conflict, right? The Vietnam War, maybe if I, you know, if I was watching it when it first came out, you know, 1979, just after, you know, you know, it's, it's, it, it takes place in Vietnam, right? I mean, it's filmed elsewhere, but you know, the, the plot and all the, it's, it's in Vietnam and it's a very, it's a very, uh, to, to me, one of the greatest films ever made. Um, if not the greatest film ever made, I, I mean, I, I, it's kind of silly to call anything that I kind of hate the greatest, whatever, but it's, it's an incredible movie. Um, but it's not just the cinematography. It's not just the acting. It's not just the, the scenes and, and, and the sets and all the work that went into it. Um, you know, that's obviously present in the work. It's the way it affects my, my, my outlook on the world, the stark realities of war, of violence, of, of, of the, the madness of it. Right. Uh, the inhumanity of it, the nihilism that it leads that, that it leads the soldier to, right? Uh, it, to me, it's a powerful film, right? It's a it's a very uh, it, it, you could say that it's an anti-war movie, you know, but but it's it's ambiguous, right? It, it, it's it's it really is uh, it's not didactic, you know. So I think I I don't know what Heidegger would have thought about it. I think you know he died in 1976, so wouldn't have been around to watch the film, and I don't think he was a big movie fan. Uh, but to me, it's a great work. It's a good example of this, right? Um, you know, and if you're not sort of aware of sort of, you know, maybe it doesn't work anymore for like a modern audience. I think it, maybe it's too slow paced. They're used to war movies that are full of action. Uh, you know, they want to sort of like, oh, this is taking too long. There's too much like build up. There's too much tension. It's, uh, you know, there's some fun and, and exciting scenes, but you know, there's a lot of build up and calm and, 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 and all that. And I think a lot, a lot of, sort of the modern uh, movie watching public are rather impatient and have a, you know, hate to say it rather short attention spans. Um, and also too, this sort of sentiment, this anti-war sentiment, unfortunately uh, doesn't have much of a voice anymore. So, you know, I don't know, is the, to me, this work is still relevant. Watching this film, it still uh, uh, has a strong message, but I don't know if it's really going to, it would get through uh, to like a millennial, for instance, somebody who was born after September 11th or something like this. Uh, they're they're in a different world. They're they're a part of a different openness to beings, as Heidegger would put it. And I'm not sure if this work, Apocalypse Now, would affect them. It would. I don't know if it would be a work for them. Um, so again, it doesn't. It, you know, when when he talks about preserving the work, right, keeping with it, and and standing in the truth that is open through it. Again, it doesn't reduce us to private experiences, but it brings us to an affiliation with the truth happening in the work. It puts us in a connection in a certain sense with the world in which we inhabit, which is not a private world. It's a world we are, we're all a part of. We all inhabit it. We all take part in creating, creating it to a certain extent. 
Um, and we all stand in it, take a stand on it, take a stand against it. So again, uh, this work grounds being for and with one another as the historical standing out of human existence in reference to unconcealedness, right? Truth as unconcealedness, revealing what is there, what is present. Most of all, knowledge in the manner of preserving is far removed from that merely aestheticizing uh, uh, connoisseurship of the work's formal aspects, its qualities and charms. Knowing is having seen is a being resolved. It's a standing within the conflict that the work has fitted into the rift, right? He's referencing the rift design, which we talked about already in the previous video, so I won't go into that too much here, right? But again, if, if I'm appreciating, for instance, Apocalypse Now, like what he's saying here, by just as it's some aestheticizing uh, uh, connoisseurship, you know, looking at, oh, wow, look at how great the edits were in that film. Look at how much work Stan, uh, Fran Francis Ford Coppola put into the sets. And look, look at the acting by Martin Sheen and, and Brando improvised all the works. And this is just a, a perfect example of acting at its finest and cinematography. My goodness, look at the way the, the, the film is shot. You know, for him, that's not preserving the work. That's not the kind of knowledge he's talking about here. The knowledge, uh, the knowing that he's talking about is a sort of taking a stand. It's a willing, right? It's, it's, it's a resolution. It's, it's standing in the truth of the work. That's not saying I'm, I'm resolving the problems of war. I'm not going to watch Stanley, uh, sorry, uh, Francis Ford Coppola's movie and decide like, I have all the answers. I know what right and wrong is. War's bad, you know, peace good. No, but it makes me see how difficult these issues are as issues, right? I, I, I preserve that tension. I preserve that rift, right? Um, it's, it's being resolved, not in the sense of um you know not in the sense of like having all things decided but again it's a standing within the conflict that the work has fitted into this rift right so as soon as the thrust as soon as the way this work affects us right the way that it sort of draws us into its world and makes us reflect on our own world you know, let's the world world, right? As soon as that thrust, you know, also the, the earth juts forth, right? That that aspect of it. But as soon as the thrust into the extraordinary is parried and captured by the sphere of familiarity and uh, connu uh, can't say that word, um, connoisseurship, you know, once it becomes a part of this sphere, for Heidegger, that's when the art business has begun, right? I've got a picture here now of the uh, 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray digital 40th anniversary six, six disc set edition of apocalypse now with probably like eight you know hours of extra footage and outtakes and behind the scenes and film critics analyzing it that's not what he's talking about right it's not what he's talking about when he talks about this knowing okay for for heidegger that's not the work right you know that's that's the art business right that's taking the work outside of its context you know this is something that he and both john dewey share they don't quite like this approach to art right um it no longer is the artwork that it was it's taken out of its world it's removed from its world uh, and we already talked about this in previous lectures so i won't get too much into it here right but let's continue with the quote even a painstaking handing on of works to posterity all scientific efforts to regain them no longer reach the work's own being, but only a recollection of it. But even this recollection may still offer to the work a place from which it joins in shaping history. So, you know, maybe even me who love this, one of my favorite films, if not my favorite film, um, <clears throat> maybe even though this film affects me, like I like when I watched it the first time, I was like, it's it, this is a badass movie, right? Like it's it's badass. Um, and then I saw it again. And the more I see it, the more I thought it was great. And the more depth and the more, you know, the more I got out of it. Right. But maybe even if I would have seen it the year it came out, I mean, I was not even, I was barely, you know, I was a little baby in a crib. You know, but if I was old enough and I knew, you know, I'd lived through the Vietnam War, you know, as a cultural phenomenon, maybe I wouldn't, didn't even have to go there, but I was aware of it. I knew the struggles. I knew all the protests. I knew all the arguments for and against. I knew all, all the, the death and all, all the horrible things that, that result, resulted from it. Perhaps this film 
would have affected me and struck me in, a, in an even more intense manner, right? Um, but so anyway, but, one, but one, once, once it's, it's sort of aestheticized in the sort of, uh, you know, sphere of familiarity, as Heidegger puts it, um, it loses this uh, uh, thrust, you know, this sort of, this workly uh, character. The work's own peculiar reality, on the other hand, is brought to bear only where the work is preserved in the truth that happens by the work itself. So enough about preservation of the work and what that means for Heidegger. Now we're going to kind of come back to what I, you know, what he was talking about at the very beginning of the essay, kind of the outset, and, and sort of the main focus of this whole series of lectures that he's giving. Remember, it's the thing that he's talking about in general. This is just one part, the, the thing. He's looking at a work of art as a particular type of thing and what makes it different. You know, it's a work. It's not just a thing, it's a work. And so now he's gonna to return to the thing, the aspect of the work of art. We've, we've, we've kind of exhausted the, the work character, the workly part of the work. What's the thingly part, okay? And he says, we can return to our opening question. How do matters stand with the work's thingly feature that is to guarantee its immediate reality? Well, his, here's his answer, and you might not be really satisfied with it, but he's going to say they stand so that we now no longer raise the question about the work's thingly element. For as long as we ask it, we take the work directly as a foregone conclusion, as an object that is simply there. In that way, we never question it in terms of the work, but in our own terms. In our terms, we, who then do not let the work be a work, but view it as an object that is supposed to produce this or that state of mind in us. So when we ask this question, what is the thingliness of the work? For Heidegger, this is wrong to even ask. Now that we've talked about what a work is, and what makes a work a work, namely this happening of truth by setting up a world and bringing forth the earth, review previous videos if you're not following me on that one. Um, but if that's what a work does, if the work is a, bring, a happening of truth, if it's a bringing forth of truth, okay, if we're trying to analyze it by some philosophical discourse, right? How do I define it as a thing? How is it different from other things? How does it fit into this regime of da, da, da? I need to explain, explain, explain. How does it fit? This is the wrong way of going about it, right? The work is not going to work, right? We're expecting a sort of, a sort of outcome. We're, we, we have a procedure that we're, we're going through. We're trying to fit it into some, some sort of category. And it's not a category that needs to be fit into. It's, 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 a, it's a whole gestalt, a whole uh, 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 world, state of being that is affected in us, right? A, a happening, as Heidegger puts it, that, that, it that, that, that is present in the work of art. I love this quote by Billy Connolly, right? You know, he's, he, I think that Heidegger, I don't know if he would like this. It's kind of crude uh, in a certain sense, but it's funny. And I think it kind of gets to the point of the matter. Uh, you know, Connolly's being kind of silly. He says, I don't understand art speak. My pictures are big doodles. I'm amazed when people come up with, uh, sorry, I'm amazed what people come up with when they look at them. There's one of a figure with two heads that somebody thought must be a comment on the state of matrimony. None of it is a comment on anything, okay, right? So the work is just there, right? So you know, people are looking for meaning. Well, this represents that. And, you know, th this sort of kind of comes back to one of the objections I mentioned that got me all stirred up in one of the previous videos. I got a little, a little angry. But one of the common objections against this essay is that Heidegger's wrong. That painting is not actually about Van Gogh. It's not about uh, the peasant's shoes. It's actually Van Gogh's shoes. Duh, Heidegger's wrong. Duh. No, that's that's thinking that, oh, the work has this one specific meaning. This is what it actually means. And if, you know, it, it has to correspond. And if, if you don't get it, you don't get it. You're an idiot, right? No, no. The point is the work, it, it evokes a certain uh, repose. As Heidegger, I was going to say response, but that's even maybe too forceful. But it causes a certain reflection. Uh, and it sort of brings the world, you know, sorry, brings the, the earth to the forth 
to, to the forefront in the material, in the work. And it makes us think about the world, like the, the world of the peasant, you know, or maybe the world of the artist, if we realize it is Van Gogh's shoes, okay? It could be anything, right? The idea that, oh, Bill Connolly was drawing these two people, the double-headed person as a sign of a uh, state of matrimony. No, no. <laughs> I love this quote from Picasso as well, right? He says, everyone wants to understand art. Why don't we try to understand the song of a bird? Why do we love the night, the flowers, everything around us without trying to understand them? But in the case of a painting, people think they have to understand. I think Heidegger would, would really like this quote. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, going to take a, put my neck out there and going to say, I think he would be totally in. I don't know if he would really like Picasso's art. I, I think he might not, actually. But I think you'd appreciate this quote, right? When I see a Picasso painting, I should appreciate it and just sort of let it sort of transport me into this world. I'm not saying, what does it mean? What, what is that about? I don't get it. You're going about it the wrong way, right? You're, 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 you're trying to find some sort of, you know, you're not letting the work work. And, and maybe that's the fault of the artist, you know, or maybe it's just you're in the wrong headspace. And, you know, I have a big debate with people that they love here in Houston. There's the, uh, the, uh, the Rothko Chapel, you know, and I'm just not a big fan of Mark Rothko. I'm sorry. I mean, some of his, some of his, I, I like abstract uh, art. I do. I like abstract paintings. Um, it's not that. I'm like, I don't get it. What is it a painting of? I'm not, no. I like some of his paintings. They're good. But the Rothko Chapel, people are just like, dude, that place is so awesome. I love the Rothko Chapel. It's so spiritual and deep. And da, da, da. And I just, I don't, I think it's overrated. But one day I went there. This is kind of funny. I went to the Rothko Chapel one day. And I went with my friends were visiting from out of town and they wanted to go. So I was like, yeah, well, we'll go to, I, I, I love the Manil collection. It's at the Manil. And fine, let's go to the Manil. And we'll go to the Rothko Chapel. Um, so we go in there and I'm just sort of sitting there and, and, and kind of waiting for them to, to have their experience and to enjoy it. And oddly enough, I really like, for the first time in my life, I think I appreciated the Rothko Chapel. Like I actually, I still think it's overrated, honestly, but I think I got that, that sort of somberness, that calm repose, that sort of like, I mean, I got, I got the experience that people were sort of, but maybe it's because of what I was talking about here. I expected a certain thing. Like there was all this sort of built up uh, uh, talk about the Rothko Chapel. And so when I went in there, I already had this sort of preconceived idea of what to expect. And so when I did, when I went in there with that sort of pre-framing, it, it sort of, it ruined it for me, right? I was like, well, this isn't that great. But the day I went in there, when I already kind of had this, oh, it's overrated, it's not that great. When I kind of was just standing there and just let the art be there i was like wow this this space the way it is yeah i okay yeah this is a really great this works right um so anyway right um when we try to find as he puts it the thing the thing the element of the work of art uh we're kind of asking the wrong question uh but he says what looks like the thing the element in the usual sense of a thing concept in the work taken as an object is seen from the perspective of the work, its earthly character. So if you have to sort of, you know, if you want to ask, well, what's the thingliness of the work? Um, if you, if you have to sort of look for an answer, the sort of the, the one that kind of jumps out at us is that, well, it's, it's, it's earthly character, right? Remember the work for Heidegger is, you know, a housing or a, a presencing of both world and earth. It sets up a world and it sets forth the earth. So that earthly part, right? The fact that it's made out of marble or made out of paint or made, and, and, and that that jumps out at you, the material jumps out as the material it is. Uh, that would be sort of obviously, I guess, the thingness of it, the thingliness, right? Earth juts up from within the work because the work exists as something in which truth is at work. And because truth occurs only by in installing itself within a particular being, right? Truth only exists as something that is, and a work of art is. And in this sense, truth is as a work of art. So here's, I'm not going to go over this too much and, and get into this too quick. I, I'm, I'm not going uh, to spend too much time on this. I'm going to go over it pretty quickly because we, we cover this in detail in, in one of the earliest videos, right? But, you know, these three interpretations of the thing that we've looked at in, in, in the essay, right, that Heidegger covered already, um, 
they're not going to get at the the thingness, right? They're, they're gonna they're always gonna sort of lead us astray when we start thinking about art. There's always gonna be something left out, right? So determine and and to determine the thing's thingness, you know, the work of art. Neither consideration of the bearer of properties is adequate, nor of the manifold of sense data in their unity. And least of all, that of the matter form structure regarded by itself, which is derived from equipment. Again, this is a bit of a review or a recap, right? Right. The, the sort of bearer of properties is inadequate because, you know, remember this one is just a little too, um, it's too broad. It doesn't distinguish beings. The manifold of sense data is not true to our experience of things. Things jump out at us. They're not just sort of a part of this flow of, of 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 chaos that that is that is that is reduced to a thing, and the matter form structure fall fails because it really just gets at the essence of equipment, things that are used. It doesn't get at things like art or God or humans, right? So all of these interpretations of the the thing are inadequate in one way or the other, right? Um, so to anticipate a meaningful and weighty interpretation of the thingly character of things. We must aim at the things belonging to the earth, right? So this is Heidegger's suggestion, right? This is, this is sort of the payoff we got through, through this seeming digression of analyzing a work of art, right? Through the analysis of a work, we started to realize what really a thing is. You know, it's not these three, right? It's not these three philosophical conceptualizations of a thing but it, it's really just it's this this earth right thingness belongs to the earth as he puts it the nature of the earth in its free and unhurried bearing bearing and self-closure reveals itself however only in the earth jutting into a world and the opposition of the two again this is a bit of review right that the world is what makes the earth have a, it, it gives the earth its earthliness, the character of being in earth and stark contrast from the world. Or sorry, yeah, so the temple, the Greek temple is in stark contrast from the thunder and the storm outside, right? This conflict is fixed in place in the figure of the work and becomes manifest by it. What holds true of equipment, namely that we come to know its equipmental character specifically only through the work itself, Right. He, he did this in, you know, earlier in the essay through, through reflecting on on Van Gogh's painting. And then he starts to realize what what it is to be a piece of equipment is to be reliable reliability, which actually makes you lose sight of the equipment. So it's only through a work, through the reflection of a work of art that we got to the equipment, uh, equipmental character of equipment. So what holds true of equipment also holds of the thingly character of the thing. So he thinks that through the work of art, not only did we get to the equipmental character of equipment, but we got to the thingly character of the thing, right? This, 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 this um, element of earth. The fact that we never know thingness directly, you know, just like we don't know the, the equipmental being of equipment directly, we have to get it indirectly through reflecting on a work of art. When we're using equipment, it's so effective, we lose sight of it, right? So again, the fact that we never know thing, thingness directly, and if we know it at all, only vaguely, and thus requires the work, this fact proves indirectly that in the work's work being, you know, what makes it a work, the happening of truth, the opening up or disclosure of what is, is at work, right? So works of art reveal to us, <clears throat> or works in general reveal to us the equipmental character of equipment, and the thingly character of the thing. And so therefore, this is even further evidence for Heidegger's contention that what, you know, what the work does, what makes it a work, is this happening of truth, right? It, it's an opening up or disclosure of what is, okay? Now, Heidegger has this interesting take on the relationship between art and nature. Almost every philosopher we've covered this semester Except for maybe Hume, I, maybe he's the only one. I, I, I'm, I, maybe I'm just forgetting. He might have actually covered it. I just, I'm just not remembering. Um, every one of them, it seems, to tie, they tie art to nature in some way or another, right? Aristotle says that art finishes what nature can't complete, right? 
uh, Schopenhauer says something similarly, right? He says that the, you know, the will that is nature, the will is trying to become manifest in representation, in the things that we see in the phenomenal world, right? And the artist takes that will and, and, and furthers it to the state of perfection. And so art, the artist is kind of like answering nature and saying, see, this is what you meant, right? This is what you meant to say. Um, so, so again, this, this tying of art to nature is nothing new. How does Heidegger work it in here? What does Heidegger have to say about this relationship between art and nature? He, he, he provides a quote from Al, Albrecht Dürer, this, uh, you know, German painter. Um, no, he's not German, is he? He's, he's Flemish, I think. I, I don't know, I forget. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's, a, he, he's more, mostly famous. I should have got some paintings from him for the presentation. He's mainly famous for his uh, uh, portraits, self-portraits. But uh, Durer, after all, did make this remark. He says, in truth, art lies hidden within nature. He, he who can wrest it from her has it, right? So, so this is a typical conception of the relationship between art and nature it's nothing really new again you could argue schopenhauer right the artist sees something in nature and sees it in a way that we can't see it he's got this this eye and he's able to bring it out in such an intense way in the work of art that we're able to see it we're able to to oh wow i never noticed that right um and so what does heidegger have to say about that he says well true there lies hidden in nature a rift design. We already talked about rift design in, in the last video. So there lies hidden this rift design, right? There's something in nature. There, there's a way in which that block of granite can be worked out and become a sculpture, right? There is a rift design, again, that's hidden in nature, a measure and a boundary. And tied to it, a capacity for bringing forth. That is art. And that's the closest you're going to get to a definition of art, I guess, from Heidegger, right? A capacity for bringing forth. <clears throat> this, this, this bringing forth, this, this thing that strikes us, that calls out, that shines forth, right? And is brought forth. This process, this, this bringing forth, the capacity for bringing forth is art, is what we, we name art. But he, he qualifies here, right? So, so yes, yeah, sure, there's a rift design in nature. There's a measure, a boundary. There's a capacity for bringing forth. But it is equally certain that this art hidden in nature becomes manifest only through the work because it lies originally in the work, right? So again, this is a bit like Schopenhauer. You know, remember Schopenhauer, you know, he says, see, that's what you meant to say. That, you know, the artist creates the work of art and he tells mother nature, that's what you were going for, wasn't it? And I finished it, I, I perfected it, I, I made it perfect, right? That's not exactly what Heidegger's saying here. But what he is saying is that there are these things that are brought to our attention. There are things that are, were already there, right, that, that were true, that, that had being, okay? And the artist brings them to our presence through the work, originally in the work, right? There, are, again, this hidden in nature becomes manifest, become, you know, for the first time we see the sky as a sky. We see the colors as color. We see the earth as earth, right? This is what the, the, the work brings forth, right? The earth was always there, but it was hidden, right? And now it's brought forth. Now we appreciate the grain on the marble and the grain on the granite and all this stuff and the beauty within and no longer just using it as a functional thing to get through our day or to, to, to survive our environment. Okay, so now he's going to get into, and this we really need to leave for the last video, okay, because this is kind of winding things down. He's going to start talking about the relationship, again, between truth and art and, oddly enough, poetry. For Heidegger, he, in a certain sense, sees all art itself as a kind of form of poetry. Uh, and that needs a lot of explaining. And I think this video is getting as long, already a little bit longer than I want it to be. So we're going to go ahead and stop it here. We're going to begin our, our next video, which should be the last video, probably a bit longer than the other videos, but this should be it. We might have to have like maybe like a, a, a video number 14 as like just a quick sort of 
concluding video. We'll kind of see how it goes in the next one. But as always, uh, I, you know, I totally appreciate you guys that stuck around to the end of this one. Uh, we're almost done with Heidegger. And, you know, once you're done with this, you're going to, you know, you're going to be a Heidegger expert, right? Well, maybe not. Maybe you, you might know a lot more about this essay in particular, for sure. Uh, and you can always go back and review previous videos to sort of deepen your understanding. So, again, thanks a lot. And I hope to see you on the other side.